Okay, good evening, colleagues. Welcome to the number 25th Tourism Online Forum series uh, in August 2023. This series is hosted by the Center for Advanced Tourism Research, CATS, at Hokkaido University. This is your host, Mo. Today, we are very honored to have Dr. Gang Fu to share her recent research, Secrets of Community-Based Tourism Success from Vietnam. So Dr. Gian uh, holds a PhD in tourism social innovation from a Griffith University tourism program ranked number three globally. Uh, so he's a very famous university, a global citizen who has lived in four countries uh, across three continents. She also were recently worked as an assistant professor in tourism innovation, entrepreneurship at Copenhagen, Denmark, and currently uh, Wien University, Hanoi, Vietnam. So Yang is a, a passionate lecturer with over 10 years of teaching experiences. She is also an acclaimed writer with three research awards and four international books. The latest book called Vietnam Tourism, Policies and Practice. Her current research and interests are design thinking, digitalization, social entrepreneurship and education in the context of tourism and hospitality. Outside academia, Yang has served on the advisory board of CBT Travel and cons uh, Consulting Social Enterprise since 2014. So please note that this online lecture will be recorded and uploaded to the uh, YouTube channel of Center for Advanced Tourism Research. So now let's invite uh, uh, Gyan Sensei, uh, to start her lecture. If you have any question and comment, uh, well, we welcome to leave in the Q and A box below. So, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Meng, for your uh, warm introduction. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. No problem. Yes. So I'm trying to turn on my camera, but it doesn't seem to work. I think it does now. So uh, if the connection just get messed up again, then I would have to turn it off. So my apologies okay. in advance. And uh, thank you everyone for coming to the talk today. It's about secret of community-based tourism success in Vietnam. And uh, it's actually from my research background back in 2014, uh, being on the advisory board of the community-based tourism social enterprise. So, oops, let's see if I can move forward. Okay. So a little bit about myself, um, that man has uh, already introduced. I. Uh, graduated from Griffith University in 2017 and uh, has been teaching for over 10 years. And my two recent books actually critical issue in tourism co-creation and Vietnam tourism. So let's talk about community-based tourism. Um, perhaps you can type in the chat board if you have Maybe number one, if you actually have been to a community-based tourism destination before, or zero if you've never been. So one, if you did, zero, if you never. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so I can see that man actually did. Uh, so, Let's talk about what is community-based tourism first, because there's a lot of uh, definition on it and also different understanding of community-based tourism. Oops. So it's actually defined as a form of tourism where the local community has substantial control over and involvement in its development. So by this definition, then when you go to a lot of places that claim to be community-based tourism, it may actually not be. It just take place in a rural or remote area. But if it doesn't have sufficient control of the local community, then it's not qualified as community-based tourism. But how can we get the local community to actually involve? Because they do not have sufficient capacity 
a lot of the time. So the basic of community-based tourism is to twist the scale so that the benefit actually do not just go to a few people, uh, especially people from outside, like external investor, but actually go into the local people through job, through uh, infrastructure, and so on. So a little bit about the history of community-based tourism in Vietnam. Um, we was under sanction from the US for a really long time. So our um, our economy was not really sufficiently open up internationally. But at early at the 1990s, community-based tourism was individually led. That meant there was a few local entrepreneurs who saw the opportunity to open up the homestay to cater to diplomatic expat. So can be family from embassy coming to stay in Hanoi and then visit the one of the first villages of community by tourism in Vietnam, which is the Lai village. And then after that, we see a rapid expansion of NGO-led community-based tourism project. And this started from 2000 and aligned with the Millennium Development Goals and the Propo Tourism Framework. So if you can see the development agency that involved in this area, um, during this period between 2000 and 2015, there was actually Japan International Cooperation Agency along with so many other development agencies. Okay, so I see one person commented that they have seen several CBT destinations in Malaysia and it's very popular in South Asia. Yes, uh, thank you for your comment. And it's exactly because it's aligned with the proper tourism framework and it's NGO and development agency led that is popular in most developing countries, not just in South Asia, but also in Latin America, in, in Africa and so on. Yeah, and there's a huge issue with this NGO led, which I will turn on in a few minutes. And the third type of community-based tourism in Vietnam is actually private investor led. So the it can be coincident. So it can be a really wealthy investor coming to visit a rural area, totally love it, and decided to pour a lot of money into it. And after that, the community started to see opportunity and it go back to this individual led where a few local entrepreneurs would actually start it to build their own homestay uh, to go along with this resort, for instance. Yeah. And we also have community led, very, very, uh, rare that we see it happen, that the community really came together and developed community-based tourism with little influences from outside. And in Vietnam, we have this village called Sin Sui Ho, and that's the village where most of the people actually uh, uh, of Christianity uh, religion, and they under the the sort of leading of the priest or the leader. And that's how the whole community was come, were united through the religion and then they came to do the, the tourism together. So just so you understand the history of community-based tourism in Vietnam and different type and influences of who's actually involved uh, uh, to develop it. So the issue with most community-based tourism development is that there's this dichotomy uh, or the continuum of development first and tourism first. So on the left-hand side, development first, as I mentioned, it would be the NGO, the development agency um, that come in to create a, a project to reduce poverty and to achieve other sustainable development goals but they lack connection with the tourism market because most of the NGO staff, they do not have any knowledge of tourism or how tourism market actually work. And it's often a short term because they are funded for only a limited time, probably a year to three years. And when the project finished, the funding ran out, they withdrew from the community and the community project cannot sustain itself after that. So that's the issue of development first. And then we have the issues of tourism first. So if we just have outsider investor coming in and, and develop the local destination, then um, 
it focus on profit, mostly for the company, the owners themselves, and they lack commitment to support the community and sustainability. So we have to really find ways to solve this dichotomy and really bring out the or empower the local community to really uh, take over and develop true community-based tourism. So over the years, I have come across many myths of rural community-based tourism. So I've heard things from, okay, we have no money to invest in tourism facility. We have no tourism skill. We cannot speak English. And uh, our place is too far. So the roads are bad and tourists cannot get there, for instance. And then a really interesting myth is that the local people think that there is nothing special in their own place because they've grown up there their whole life. So they do not understand what's really unique about their culture or their landscape, their environment, and so on. So these are the most common myths that I have come across that prevent the community uh, from really being empowered to develop tourism. So are there any myths or complaints that you heard when engaging with CBT development? Maybe I'll just give you a minute to type in the chat box. So if the, you come to a community, you try to develop tourism, and then you hear a lot of complaints that it cannot happen. Yeah. So I will keep moving, but uh, keep in mind that you can answer at any time. Okay, so let's see how we actually solve the myth and the problem that I mentioned earlier. So this is the first ever project back in 2012 in my head Huaben village of Vietnam. So this community-based tourism project is involved Thai minority group. And 32% of household living in this area is actually under poverty condition. 24% suffer under nourishment between crop. So if you come from an agriculture community, you would know that at a certain time, you would have crop and you have maybe a lot of money after you sell that crop, but you only have maybe two crop a year. And between these crop, you may run out of money. So that's why a lot of them suffer under nourishment between crops. And they also losing authenticity slowly because they they get assimilated with the majority culture, which is the king culture of Vietnam. So I'm from the king culture, and uh, I think we the majority, so around ninety percent or more. And the uh, other fifty three ethnic group actually minority. So they actually not confident of speaking their language or wearing their traditional clothes as shown in the picture, but they try to mimic what the King people does. So in this context, uh, we had the Center for Community Health and Development that came in in 2011. And this is funded by a German development agency. So Miserio and Bread for the World. So they built it for a year, but they saw the problem because of their limited knowledge of tourism. So they was just doing workshop and teaching people theory of tourism which didn't work in real reality. And the local people was very skeptical if they can do tourism and whether they can sustain themselves after this, uh, this NGO withdrew. So in 2012, Cohen actually did a very smart move and they invited an external partner, which is uh, Mr. Bin Yu. So he's the, a retired tour director and uh, also a resort designer. So he came in and he was able to come up with an entirely new model for community-based tourism that aligned with the local interests as well as the market. It was so successful that in 2014, 
Uh, he was discovered by CC, which is the social initiative promotion, and encouraged him to create a social enterprise to scale this project up and support the whole uh, different communities in Vietnam. Um, so I actually was on board together uh, with Mr. Bing from 2014, right from the beginning. And we were so successful that in 2020, I organized a 10 feet walking workshop for community benefit tourism to bring academics from all over the world to come there to to learn about the model and also to find part way for a new school of tourism and social entrepreneurship. And by 2023, by now, uh, we have supported over 80 projects all over Vietnam and have been to change the life of millions of people. Um, so without further ado, I would get into the secret of how we did it right now. Um, if you have any question, then feel free to type in the chat box and um, I might answer it immediately or I may come back in the last 30 minutes where I do the Q&A session. So how did we redefine the community-based tourism experience in Vietnam? A few things that we should keep in mind is the empathetic desires. And I will talk about being empathetic and incorporating with design in a few minutes. We also have to do capacity building, market connection, as well as a long-term commitment to support the community. So these are sort of a few images from the, the original um, homestay. So uh, you can see that most of the time, when local people in Vietnam do community-based tourism, um, they, they offer exactly what they have, which is the same mattress that they sleep on. And it's actually very difficult for tourists um, because it's very hard and tough on tourists. And also, they do not separate it the eating and the sleeping area. So a lot of the time it's not hygiene, for instance, and it's not inviting, there's no privacy when you come and stay in a homestay like this. Um, in other words, most of the community-based tourism are actually very low quality and cannot really cater to high-end tourists. So they only cater to domestic tourists or backpackers at showing the photos. So a few basic design that we come up with, we started from the home state. And by being empathetic with the tourists, we understand that when tourists come to visit an area, they need to be satisfied of their basic needs. And that means they must be able to sleep well, to take a good bath, and to, to feel that they're safe in terms of uh, also food and hygiene and so on. And they can actually eat the food because a lot of the time when people come into a new place and they, they if the food is unfamiliar to them, then they cannot stay for long. Like often they come and they left during the same day or they can only stay for one day and that's it and they move on. So it creates a huge issue for a destination to attract tourists and retain them. So we actually come up with uh, um, the in basic innovation, which is to create flushing toilet and then separating the eating and the sleeping area. And we offer uh, curtains, which give people privacy. So every bed would have curtain and also socket for phone and so on. So basic design that did not cost much money, but actually helped to change and create a much more comfortable experience for tourists. For the food, we also offer things that they are familiar with, such as bread and yogurt, coupled together with local food so they can try. It. 
And after we were able to offer the first experience and receive regular tourists, then the local entrepreneurs can continue to upgrade uh, from existing facility to offer private room. So private room actually has much higher yield than the dormitory I showed earlier. So instead of building new, they can upgrade from existing housing or when they have enough uh, funding, after they've been running tourism for a while, then they can do new construction. So this flexibility allow the local people at any level, they go step by step from little funding to more funding to join the tourism system. So this is the uh, homestay owner of the first ever project that we did. So uh, the couple, um, they did not have much money at all and to put in $4,000 or nearly 18 million Vietnam dong for them was a fortune. But because they believe in our expertise and the principle that we offer that they invested and help them to lift themselves out of poverty and also to support the whole community to change their life. So after we was able to develop the first homestay, if the activity only stay in the homestay, it's very boring for tourists, right? And the rest of the community do not get benefit. So we have to also think of the value added tourism activities so that everyone else can join the tourism system. And we do it by integrating with existing livelihood. So existing livelihood means that if you are farmers, then you can develop tourism products based on that experience. Um, and also if there's a local stream, then we can offer the, the rafting on the stream uh, and so on. So we're building things around the existing culture and existing livelihood. So people do not have to quit whatever they're doing to become a tourism worker, but they can incorporate and earn and diversify their income from these activities. And we can support them to preserve their culture at the same time. And the most important thing is that we need to maintain the service quality because at this point in time, if we connect the local community with the international system um, and we have tour companies sending regular tours over, then we need to make sure we keep a certain level of standard in terms of cleanliness, in terms of uh, catering services to tourists, in terms of pricing and so on. So they all... Um, part of the broader system of franchising of community-based tourism social enterprise so that we have the same standard and we continue to check and maintain it over time. For it to happen, we also found out that local communities, they really need coaching. And by coaching, it means you have to hold their hand and show them what to do. So it's not like a theory class where you sit down like this, you know, but if you want them to make uh, a smoothie, for instance, then you definitely have to show them the fruit and then they can come and make it themselves and so on. Um, or guiding, then you have to show them the area and then, you know, explaining when and where to say what, for instance. And later on, we also started with remote coaching because during COVID time, it's really hard for us to travel to different community to actually uh, show people what to do. So a lot of the time we have to use technology like Skype and then Zoom and so on to actually do the coaching during COVID. And what we realize is that these people, they're actually very smart once you offer them the right approach. So not just sit down and learn theory, but actually show them and then let them repeat and fail and repeat and learn from experience. So the expertise can be trained.
But that's not enough because if we just keep showing them what to do, then they cannot be empowered and self-sustained. So an important part of the coaching is actually to help them to realize their important asset and help them to sort of awake this innovators inside them so that later on they can create new products and service themselves. So these are a few examples that was created uh, by the local people. So we did not have a part in this, but just showing them the principle that they should use the environmental friendly material in their surroundings. So you can see that in the mountainous area, they use a lot of bamboo to create different uh, lighting system. In the, in the uh, coastal area, they use seashell, for instance. Um, so local people, just by showing them the principle and encouraging them to create, they was able to create many new innovation. So another example would be the way that they present the food. So you can see in this photo that, okay, we teach them to use the normal blade and so on, right? But they actually created a little basket on the left-hand side there that's weaving from the local material, the bamboo. So just adding the local touch to it. And then they took it a step further during COVID. So they reverted the whole uh, meal and back to their original representation of the ethnic minority, which is to use a tray and the banana leaf instead of using the little bowl that we saw in the earlier picture. Okay, so let's move on to how we connect them with the tourists. So we have managed so far to create this whole set of innovation and products and services to cater to tourists, right? But for tourists to come, we still have to find the existing source of uh, tourism market. And by that, I mean, okay, either a popular tourist destination that uh, that close to the community bay tourism project area. Um, so in this photo, you can see that we try to connect a few projects together. So tourists can come and visit them all at the same time. And we can see here that there's a big city. So to the left, we see that there's the Cabo city. So it's a big city in the south. And there's a lot of tourists there and there's uh, infrastructure to deliver tourists there, either by ship, by uh, flying, or by road. So from there, we would try to create connection uh, from a popular tourist destination going all the way to the remote area. So within one area, we also create and map different trekking area so that if there's no existing road, then tourists can be dropped at one point and then they can start trekking sometime up to two or three hours to go to the second community based tourism project in that area. So by doing that, we're not limited in terms of infrastructure to places that's accessible by bus or car, but we can still develop it uh, without all the existing condition. And once tourists come and they started to create revenue, then we can lobby for the local government to actually create roles to connect different areas. So it just show that no matter what myth or, or setback that you encounter when you come into one project, there's always a way to work around and always creative ways to solve it. Um, 
as long as you find the existing condition, which is okay, you know, there's a, at least one uh, major attraction, maybe in three or five hours from there that you can go. And uh, uh, at least one entrepreneur in the community that's willing to, to go along with you on this project. So there need to be certain condition, but the rest can be figured out. And we also have to connect them with the tour companies. So these are a few examples of the tour company. Um, and what we found out is that they're really desperately looking for good tourism experience to send their tours. So they can have, let's say, 100,000 inbound tours from Europe, from uh, Asia, Japan, even South Korea, and so on, even uh, Canada, US. And they really want authentic experience that they cannot usually find in big city. Uh, but they couldn't find the community-based tourism project that meet the standard, uh, cleanliness and food that can cater to tours and activities and so on. So when we was able to build these good products and services and we bring to them, they was very happy to be on board. Yeah. And uh, they continue to send us feedback every time after the tour tours came back and they get the survey, then they can give us more data to continue to improve the products and services. So create good connection with tourism market and frequent flows of tourists coming in. But for it to happen, because a lot of the time, people in these local places, they do not speak English. So it's very hard for them to communicate with the tour operators. So what we did is that every time we come into an area, we would try to find someone who actually can speak some foreign language or can learn really quickly. And we nurture them to become the local moderator or coordinator so that in the beginning they can uh, connect with the tourism market on behalf of us. Yeah. And later on, they can coach other people in the community to become moderator and coordinator themselves. And it's not easy to do all of this because there's so many factors involved, right? And there's certain gatekeeper at every project. We've done over 80 projects and at every places, the gatekeeper can be, okay, it can be the village leader who did not want to join. It can be the local NGO who have different interests. It can be local governments and so on. So we really have to engage them to show them that we have been successful elsewhere and we have a model that can support the community and so on uh, so that we can all work together to support that community that's why the director of the cbt travel social enterprise mentioned that the most important thing is to successfully persuade the local resident and governments at various levels NGO and private tourism company to work together to develop community-based tourism in Vietnam. So how, how did we actually engage them? We organized trip actually to the successful CBT, especially the first one ever that I showed you earlier. So in the picture here, you can see different, uh, it can be entrepreneurs from the different community, it can be local government staff, it can be uh, NGO staff and so on. And we often organize trip for them to come and visit and see firsthand what happened. We also attended relevant conferences and organize our own conference to spread the word and show people that this should be done in terms of community-based tourism. And then we also, uh, even if we don't directly implement or support or console certain projects, we can recommend suitable action for any project and province that want to develop community-based tourism. 
So a lot of knowledge dissemination go into this stage. So the most important thing is still funding. Because a lot of the time, the local community, they do not have money, right? And that's why we have to find other partners uh, that actually can provide certain funding. We want the local entrepreneurs to invest because that will retain the power and that will empower them. But we also want them to be supported by other partners. So we have developed different models for funding. So at the top, we have the local or uh, provincial government policy. And certain government can help to subsidize interest rate when the local entrepreneurs want to borrow money from the bank and they do not have any access or collateral. Then the government can work at a guarantor to have them access to the, the low or zero interest rate or subsidize certain interest rate. So uh, they can get access to the loan in the beginning up to $100,000. We also work with non-governmental organization. Even though they do not have tourism expertise, they do have funding um, for at least a year or something. So we ask them to provide full or partial funding depending on projects. So this can go into helping them to renovate their house or buying mattresses, like in the first case of my head. Um, and so on. And, and then we also look for in-kind donation. So in-kind donation can uh, range from actual things that hotels, for instance, or restaurants can donate. It can be their tableware, it can be their bedding, their furniture, and so on, to other pro bono training or services. So in the first case, when we try to coach the community to cook food that tourists can eat, then uh, we actually got a five-star hotel chef who came and did the training for free. So it helped to bring the level up. Uh, uh, so tourists, when they came, they can really enjoy the best services at it is five-star, but in the community-based tourism setting. And the most important thing is that by doing this and involve different parties and maintaining the, the local livelihood and integrate everything with what the local community is doing, then tourism can be seen as a diversified sort of income for rural community. And it can help them to protect their culture and their environment. But what we also learn is that uh, capacity building and learning actually takes a lot of time. Right? If we go to university and we take a three or four years degree, for instance, the local community also need that much time or even longer to learn and become a good tourism and services provider or innovator. So that's why a long-term commitment is required. So we, we are not like a short-term project that we just come in and then we withdrew, but any time the community need our support and consulting, then we always come back either come back to the place or remotely, we will offer them support. So that way the community feel that they are more secure and they can actually invest and learn and be in the tourism system for a long time. Um, until they actually learn to become self-sufficient themselves. Uh, so throughout the year, uh, CBT Travel Social Enterprise actually came up with the 6E and 4E to communicate our models. So it involved uh, engaging, different partner and then different uh, stakeholders in the community and educate as well as empower, encourage, offer earning and also expand it throughout Vietnam. And the four easy is that we help them to easily create it in the first place, easily operate it, easily manage and easy sales. 
So through the system, um, the model was able to spread really quickly throughout Vietnam and beyond the 80 project that we was involved in, we have to change the standard of uh, community-based tourism in Vietnam in general. So things that are basic principles such as um, offering empathetic designs, uh, such as um, um, separating the sleeping and, and uh, eating areas and also offering flushing toilet and so on. So very basic principle um, are now offer almost at every community-based tourism destination in Vietnam. And the cleanliness of it was improved massively so that um, we were able to change the standard for the whole Vietnam uh, when they offer rural tourism in general. Uh, before I move on to the impacts of it, uh, just want to make sure that I'm still online. So can can you tie number one in the chat if you can still hear me? Yeah, no problem, at least. Okay, excellent. <laughs> okay, so uh, economic impact. So you can see that this is actually a really old project. So it, uh, uh, hi, Joanne. Thanks for joining us today. So this is the research back in 2015, so it's quite outdated. But basically, we can see that with a three homestay model, uh, we can create total 79 jobs for the whole community. And this ran from the traditional performer, laundry, tour guide, and so on. And um, you can see the tourist, tourist arrival and tourism receive on the right hand side. So it helped to increase within three year time, it increased the average annual income by five times. So massive improvement for the local community. But beyond the economic impact, we also contributed to the social impact of the community, especially of maintaining the local minority culture. So you can see that Nowadays, the local people are not afraid or are more encouraged to wear their traditional costume all the time. So they actually feel proud when wearing it and not feeling uh, discouraged. And in terms of performance and other craft and tradition, uh, they also recover it uh, gradually and integrate it into the tourist experience. And interestingly, it also supports the environment because the local people want to keep the destination clean for tourists. So you can see the stream here, it used to be uh, covered with plastic and rubbish, but on uh, Friday, the whole community came together and cleaned up the stream and they kept it clean from then on. And they also create rubbish bin. So the environment in general was gradually improved. So I think I'm getting to the end of uh, the presentation. Um, maybe you can tell us which secret or surprise uh, did you like the most in terms of developing community-based tourism in Vietnam? Um, and type it in the chat box or raise your hand. I know I went through really quickly and a lot, so let's take a moment to just remember uh, the secret that I just shared. Yeah. So going toward the conclusion. Um, so by now that is demonstrated that is entirely possible for a rural community to develop good community-based tourism themselves and have total control of it in many cases, yeah? And there is a need to follow good process and principle in community-based tourism development. There should be clear tourist market sources and connection with the tourism industry. So we really should be clear if 
there's at least a connection somewhere, maybe five hours around this area that we can bring the major source of tourists over to, to a new destination. And there need to be certain companies that we can talk to in order to deliver the constant flow of tourists. And there is the three roles of facilitating organizations such as CBT Travel Social Enterprise. So I'd, I'd be happy to hear about your experience in Japan to see if there's actually a similar company that go around and support and offer expertise to help the local community to develop products and services and also to connect with the market, right? Because we need to investigate feasibility. So sometimes when we come in and we feel that it's not ready yet. Uh, the locals are not ready or the infrastructure are not ready. It's in the middle of nowhere. Then it's almost impossible for us to start a new project. Um, also in terms of product design development, how can we develop new product and services that actually align with local environment and culture? Um, because we saw over time, there's often people from outside in and build artificial attraction that has nothing to do with local culture or environment. Yeah, and, and over time it will not sustain itself because tourists, if they come, they will lose interest really quickly and they will not come back. We also have to support the promotion and sales because local community, they often do not have any capacity and it took them a really long time to learn. And we need to have a commitment to support community over the long run. It can be five years, it can be 10 years, until whenever time they're ready, yeah. So for the future direction, um, actually we have completed the standard manual for community-based tourism in Vietnam, but it can also be used for country with similar context. So I think someone mentioned Malaysia, for instance, um, same with Thailand, same with Indonesia. Um, the same principle and processes can be applied, very, very similar. Um, An online platform can also support it. So if we have funding, we can also do online video and online consulting to support a new project, not just in Vietnam, but all over the world. And finally, um, we feel that the current education system do not support this emerging trend of local entrepreneurs and small businesses um, of developing countries, uh, but it's often just to train employees for large corporation or the Western model. And so there's a need to actually rethink and focusing on uh, the education that actually meet or the needs of the local community in South Asia or in Asia in general, and not the Western focused type of uh, education. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. So I would like to share with you all the um, relevant references that I have written over the years to communicate this model. And you can download it via the link vinuni.academia.eu slash yangfi. So, and then you can also connect with me on LinkedIn if you have further questions after this section. I'm happy to answer. So, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very, very much. It's very, so, uh, so much of the information. I think, uh, uh, I think Johan has a question. Uh, Johan, do you want to answer live or should I read it? I can, I can set you to speak if you want. Or I can, I can read it for you. And uh, thank you for your exciting presentation. What surprised me was that the emphasis seems to be on many changes for tourists. And it's not clear if those benefits are also for locals, for the community. I, I think uh, that's what he means. And tourists get beds and uh, bedrooms and they get uh, flushing toilets. Uh, but what about the locals? Are their lives enhanced in the same time? 
uh, so many questions. Uh, you talk about the better environment, but beyond sales and jobs, what are the other social benefits? So mm -hmm. that was his question. And thank you very much. Yes, I think it's a very, very good question. Um, and I think it, it goes back to the point of this presentation is that a lot of the time when we talk about community-based tourism development, NGO would actually go back and focus too much on, okay, you know, local people and how do we benefit them and they forgot the tourists. And that's why it didn't work. And in this, this lecture, I, I go the opposite, right? I'm all about, okay, how can we develop good products and services to cater to tourists so that it can generate sustainable benefit for the community. And if we go back to the, the benefit, uh, I can go back to the slide there, or maybe not. Um, if we talk about social benefit, for instance, a lot of the time, um, it go back to uh, people get incomes, diversify income, and I mentioned five times the, the incomes uh, from just doing their traditional livelihood. Like if they farm, they just have more tourists coming in once in a while. If they are, they row in the boat and so on, they just do extra. So by having the five times the income, it reduces the poverty so that they can send their children to school and then they can buy better food for their family. They can uh, improve economically um, in some sense. So that's the first thing. So when they improve income, then their lifestyle would improve. The second thing is the social benefit. So for instance, when we do anything such as bed and toilet, toilets is actually a very expensive investment for local people, especially flushing toilet. So in Vietnam, even though local people wanted to have flushing toilet, they could not afford it. So when we do these uh, upgrading, the first thing that we mentioned is that you do it for your family. So even during COVID, when there's no tourists coming, the whole family is actually using it, right? So they have flushing toilet that they can use and many projects in Vietnam when it comes to toilet. They did not think of local communities need. The NGO would come in and uh, do the buy organic toilet and it's really smelly and it's, it's, it doesn't look good in the house. So a lot of the time these projects fail. But by doing community-based tourism, we were actually able to install a lot of flushing toilet for local community to use first and foremost. Uh, so that uh, another benefit. And when we do any sort of activities, um, we do not restrict. Like if you think about a resort model, they restrict everything with, within the resort and local people cannot participate. If it's a normal resort, they will block the beach. They will do performance inside only for the tourists. But here, everything is open to the community. So when they do performance, the local community come in and listen to their own performance actually, and they can participate in the performance themselves. So everything is sort of the spirit of sharing and, and open um, so that the whole community feel better and that can preserve their culture better. Um, of course, there's so many other flow on benefit. Like, you know, if you think about a place with no electricity, on no road in the first place, but when we overcame all the obstacle to create a tourist destination, the government started to pay attention and then suddenly the next year there was road, there was electricity, there was clean water. So there's a lot of flow on effects, I would say uh, in this system that, uh, that was very interesting, uh, but definitely it can be the topic of another lecture. So we have cases of, uh, of destination that used to be uh, played with drug crimes, drug trafficking across the border and so on, or domestic violence. And then when tourism came in and changed the, the dynamic of that place, then it suddenly wiped away a lot of these uh, social issues that the NGO couldn't solve in the first place. So I hope it answers some of Johan's question. Yes, I think most of the question. Uh, can I ask a question which quite similar with Johan focus on the community side? Uh, I think you mentioned there is a lot of efforts you have to make for exp 
planning for potential tourism operators. So there is a lot of cost for communication here. So I want to know how many of this business uh, can they create it? But I, I think if you cr suddenly create two, uh, too many local businesses, that will be a problem to change local structure. So I want to know from a management perspective, how do you decide which household will become potentially to be the tourism operator? <laughs> can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, that's the probably very important question and very hard to explain. So it goes case by case, but a lot of the time we came in and we we try to identify the potential entrepreneurs. So by that, I mean, uh, we definitely look for households with uh, some resources to work with. So they could have a little block of land or they could have an abandoned house. Or in the first case, it was actually, uh, it's an abandoned buffalo sort of, Cage area. So they need to have something that we can actually work with first. So uh, if they don't have any land, then it's really difficult. And uh, they also need to show through their mindset that they are willing to learn. So they could be, you know, like in terms of entrepreneurship, you want to see that they they go with capturing opportunity and they persist then. And so there's a lot of entrepreneurial trade that maybe also we have to go into a different lecture. But we came in and we can host the first workshop for the whole community. And then we see, oh, who actually show up and really keen and engage throughout and really fast to learn and so on. And uh, and we actually came and talk to them and see if they can, can start with something. So, so it can be two or three households. We, we cannot do too many in the beginning, um, but we want to give example first. So it can be just one household that we focus on first. And then uh, usually after that, then they can spread out. Yeah, but uh, we also have cases that, uh, you know, people came in and then we try to support them and, and they, they did not want to go through. And that's fine especially if we work with the entrepreneur from the southern of Vietnam. So southern of Vietnam is different geographical condition to the north. The northern Vietnam, people are very, very poor. And without agriculture and maybe tourism, they cannot get any income. But the southern Vietnam, you know, the land are better, is better fertilized, and they have a lot of income sources. So sometimes they just come in and do it for fun. And then after a while, they're like, oh, it's too difficult to follow through and to cater to tourists every day. It requires a lot of persistence. Um, so sometimes they withdraw, and that's fine as well. <laughs> so we, we don't always have successful projects, but we support the community uh, in terms of where they are. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, uh, before I have another question, but I would like our audience to ask more questions. So there is one from Tony. Uh, Tony, do you want to ask this question in person or do you want me to read it for you? Uh, I promote you to talk right now if you want. If not, I can also read it for you. Uh, hello, can you hear you? Yes, Hi, we can hear you. Oh, thank you so much for your presentation. And thank you, everyone. So my question is about like, may I ask what the most uh, uh, attractive factors of CVT products for tourism? Because uh, personally, I experienced some uh, CVT homestays in uh, rural Malaysia before. And also, so when I went to uh, a place, as I remembered in a rural village in Sabah, and uh, so the price of each uh, stay was not actually reasonable. It's not it's not cheap to uh, to be honest, and also it's not that comfortable compared to other regular uh, tourism products. So, uh, may I ask from a perspective of demand side? So, could you share with us why people would love to make decision decision to experience CBT CBT in rural areas? Thank you. Right, thank you for your question. Um, 
Yes, so I see two main questions here. The first one is the uh, what are the most attractive factors of CBT product for tourists? And the second will be why they would decide to experience CBT in rural areas. Uh, is so that two, actually quite similar, the two questions? Yeah, two related questions, yeah. yes. Uh, so I think a lot of the time people, and after COVID, it may change a little bit. So before that, it's mostly to experience culture. So it's often associated with cultural tourism because community-based tourism is often in remote and rural area. So a lot of the traditional and cultural factor are retained and did not change that much at the city. So often the, the tourists from outside, they want to experience traditional, real traditional culture of the country. They would go to community-based tourism. And the, the domestic tourists from city, they also would like to go outside because a lot of the time we also do not experience this sort of traditional culture. And in terms of Vietnam, there's also, you know, 54 different ethnic city, 53 out of which are minority. So a lot of the time, even though I'm Vietnamese, I definitely do not understand uh, the other 53 culture because I'm the gay people, for instance. So it's important that we go there and we experience culture um, to start with. And gradually, especially during COVID, we see the trend of staycation when people want to avoid the large attraction and go to rural area because they associated it with, me, with being safe and uh, during COVID. And then after that, the trend continued because people felt like they can be healed. You know, like you have too much screen time during COVID, even now, you know, you're still at home online. So when you go there, you can get away from this sort of busy life and really, it's like a, a trend of wellness and healing tourism through going to remote area, detox from technology and also stay with nature and so on. So uh, different sort of factor when it comes to what attract tourists, uh, especially international tourists or domestic tourists, is also a different story. Yeah. And uh, in terms of pricing, I would say that, uh, you know, that when there's no principle or system and you just let people do whatever they want then the pricing you know sometimes is too too little sometimes is uh, too expensive and then it doesn't meet the quality of service so it doesn't matter the price because i've seen resort in remote area charge very high price but still sustainable because they offer the quality of tour of service and they find the right target market so it's about you have to develop certain products and services and you you identify your target market and how much they're willing to pay. Yeah. So throughout the system of community-based tourism in Vietnam, you know, can you guess how much they're paying to stay per night, including breakfast buffet and one of these house, uh, these homestay, like per night, like in terms of dollar, for instance. Uh, Actually, for a decade, we only charge five dollars per night per bed, so it's very very little, and and it helps us to sustain and still increase the income for the local community. But I think after ten years, we now have to double it because of the inflation, the cost, and everything. But still, ten dollars per night, and then we create the private room to increase the yield. So still there will be tourists who come and want to stay in private room and it will be $50. And then we build really large room that look like a villa with a bathtub and everything. And then we charge $100. People are still willing to pay and they love it. So it's about offering them at different scale uh, exactly the, the quality of products and service that meet the pricing that you're going to charge. Yeah, does it answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you so much for your for your answer. Yeah, it's very helpful. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. thank you, Tony. Do we have other questions before I ask the next one? <laughs> okay, so uh, I will have uh, probably the last questions. So, uh, when well, you mentioned about so it's related to social enterprise, I think this is a very important term because um. The social, I'm pretty sure the social enterprise in terms of rural Japan are quite different uh, with rural Vietnam in under different concepts. 
So I want to know uh, the term of social enterprise and the relationship with the tourism enterprise. What are their relationship under your research uh, focus? That was my question. So what, what are the indicators to evaluate the social outcome from this community-based tourism activity? Mm. So social enterprise, I think by definition, is that uh, it was created to solve certain uh, social environmental problem in a sustainable way. So if you just do like, you know, you do charity or you come in, you have a little bit of funding and when you leave, it doesn't solve the problem, then definitely is maybe the traditional way of doing development. It can be NGO, it can be a charity. But social enterprise is the, the other part that bridge between the private and the non-profit sector. So we, again, we have this dichotomy uh, between the non-profit and the, the for-profit sector and social enterprise can be either or it can be bridged between. But it needs to come up with something new and innovative to solve certain problem in a sustainable or long-term manner. Yeah. So this one is called social enterprise because at the core of it, it's got a social mission. So it's say, okay, we need to help redefine the community-based tourism standard of the whole Vietnam. And we need through that to change people's life for the better. So the purpose or the mission of a social enterprise, you know, okay, we're gonna create something so that we make a lot of money. But it's always it started from a social mission first and formal, and the rest will be to support that mission. So that's why it just happened that this one is in the tourism area, but we have social enterprise in all sorts of areas in Vietnam, from disabled people, uh, environmental protection, and so on. So they all have to try to come up with something new because we cannot solve the same problem that's been around for like 100 years if we offer exactly the same thing that other people did. So we always have to think of something new and innovative. And we need to have a social mission at our core. So that's basic of the social enterprise on, and social entrepreneurship. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's very fascinating. So this kind of uh, tourism development is also socially engaged to solve some certain issues. Uh, I have a follow-up question. Do you think uh, from the sustainable tourism to regenerative, uh, responsible tourism, then the regenerative tourism. This kind of a community-based tourism has potential to be regenerative for future. I think it can totally be um, hmm. because it go back to the basic idea of letting the letting the local people take control. And they will bring with them the knowledge that's been around for generations. So Vietnam's got, I think, over 4,000 years of history. And I think when we live in big city and so on, you know, we totally assimilate it and we follow Western culture and so on. But local people in remote area and my minority, they still reserve a lot of this knowledge where they, back in the time when they live in harmony with nature. So if you, enable them or empower them to become innovator and to take control of their communities, then naturally they will come up with ways that regenerative and enhance the local system and so on. Um, but of course it's the, the best scenario because when we develop these projects and we see success, then we see trend from our side. Um, so we see private investor, and even the government, the corrupted government will try to come and build new resources and, and, and turn it into, an, I don't know, another Singapore. And so, so, so it's just like, you know, before that nobody cares. And once it became a tourist destination, everyone wanted a piece of it. And it's very hard for the local community to maintain the control. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's like a long story, you know, and, and we have to keep working with it and see how it evolves. Basically, yeah. 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 Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, if there is no more other question, I think you must be very tired for uh, <laughs> it's almost uh, one and a half an hour. So uh, I will close today's session. And it's really grateful to hear a lot of insightful firsthand research experiences. 
I wouldn't just define you as a researcher. I think is you're also a petitioner in the practice. I think, like you said, we need a long-term observation and engagement for this kind of uh, uh, research. Therefore, I think it's very necessary to invite you again next year for another kind of topic. Like you also mentioned from your uh, Q&A, you, you need a different lecture to explain <laughs> and answer different questions. And in general, we can see this kind of process by uh, adapt really fast changing world through tourism for slow changing society and the community. I'm really uh, wonderful and lucky to have a lecture from Vietnam. And okay, I will close today's session and thank you very much for your uh, wonderful presentation and looking forward to meet you again and hear your future research uh, next year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your invitation and thank you everyone for participating today in the lecture. Definitely mm. keep in touch uh, and add my link. It. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening and uh, see you next time.